Well, let's move into 1987. Mm. Um, at that time, you you directed all, all the PR support that mm -hmm. really helped defeat an attempted hostile takeover at Dayton Hudson. Um, now, Arthur Page once said that all business in a democratic society begins with public permission and exists by public approval. Now, you may, I don't know if you actually thought about that statement, but would, could that statement, I mean, did it affect your approach in any decisions? Did you think about any of the, the, the Page principles and, and uh, the kinds of things that uh, Arthur Page stood for? at that time when you were, were um, going through that uh, takeover and um, what was your strategy in uh, working with the corporate lawyers <laughs> because their first instinct would be to uh, probably not say anything or as little as possible to the media and that would be counter probably to what you would be wanting to do so how did you handle that? Um, it was a very interesting time and I was not yet a member of the Page Society so I didn't really know about the Page principles but being aware of the public and and behaving like the public was the most important organization or group that you know that you were your responsibility that's how we did business all the time I mean we were we were a customer oriented business and we, that's why we gave to the communities where we did business. Long before the company was a public company, there was a belief that you had to be sure the communities where you did business were healthy. And so you gave back. Uh, and that, was, that gave people a reason to shop in your stores. But you listened to customers. You, you understood what was important to them. So when we learned, the day we learned that someone was beginning to accumulate shares of our stock, um, now, this is right after we've been named the best managed corporation in America by the University of Southern California. And the, the general thought was that the only companies that people went after were companies that were poorly managed or, you know, had some sort of issue to deal with and that something, someone thought they could do it better. And uh, so this was quite a surprise. Uh, we had another thing going for us, and that was we were a Minnesota incorporated company. Unlike many companies that are all incorporated in Delaware, uh, we were incorporated in the state of Minnesota. So we were governed by Minnesota law. So as we sat down and thought to ourselves, well, about, I don't know, 60% of our stock changed hands in the course of, of a couple of weeks' time, and so we knew that there's something going on and, um, and everyone is trying to track the stock. But as always, the most valuable source to us is the media because they have all these sources and they would call us and tell us who they had heard it was that was buying our stock. Um, we met as a group. The CEO convened a group of his top advisors and we brought in our outside advisors. And we looked at all of our options and we decided that the best option, because we had always been so community focused, concerned about our employees, concerned about where we did business, was not to do a knee jerk reaction kind of thing, but to very thoughtfully go to the state of Minnesota and say, let's look at the law. Let's see. We didn't think it was right. Uh, the people that were identified as acc accumulating our stock were green mailers. They were people that would come in and they would, um, they would say, um, they didn't really have a lot of money, but they would they would could get enough money that they could buy a company and then they would come in and break it up and sell it off. Or they would convince you to pay them so much for all their shares that they would green mail you into getting rid of them. Well, we didn't like that. That's not how we did business. And so we said, let's look at the laws. If someone has good money and wants to buy this company, then you have some fiduciary duties that you can't ignore. And, but in the mean, but we don't think it's right that you have that you can come in and break up our company and sell it off. So, we decided that's the way we were going to go, and thus began what we referred to as seven days in June. And it was a seven-day program that started with a visit to the governor, and uh, who famously said on television that when the CEO called and said, "I have to meet with you this evening," he said to his wife, "Have you overcharged at Dayton's?" 
And, uh, but at that point in time, we drew up ads to run in newspapers statewide. We commissioned a poll of people of Minnesota to find out if they thought that changing the law, strengthening the law to prevent people coming in and breaking, busting up companies. Uh, we had a slogan that said, I like Dayton Hudson whole, not halved, because the people coming after us were the halves. And, uh, and so we, we launched a seven-day campaign to convince the people of Minnesota that the governor should call a special session and uh, change the law to prevent people from coming in without good money. And, um, and so that was what we learned in the, in the survey of people of Minnesota was they all agreed that something should be done. But we had thought it would be because of all the money we'd given or all the, the contributions we'd made. What we found was the people of Minnesota said, yes, do something for them because they have this wonderful liberal return policy. <laughs> And they've trusted us all these years. They've never asked for a receipt. Or they've just taken it back if we said we bought it there. So, and that was, that was the tipping point that made it safe for the legislators to agree to have a special session. And uh, so that was, that was the program. And it was the most covered story in the United States uh, because we were fighting a hostile takeover threat. Um, because so much stock had traded hands and uh, because these people were sort of colorful. Mm -hmm. And um, they owned Crown Books, and, which was a discount bookstore. And at the time, we owned B. Dalton Bookseller, which was now what you know today as Barnes & Noble. But it was um, probably, it was, if we could go back and do it over again, there are lots of things we'd, we would do over again. And one of them was how to deal with lawyers. Because this is something, um, in one of our meetings, my CEO said, have any of you ever done this before? <laughs> we all said, no. We've never been through this kind of thing before. So when you have investment bankers and lawyers and everyone telling you, you can't say this, you can't say that, you can't say this, and we kept saying, but we can respond to the media. We can put out news releases. Why can't we communicate with our employees? But corporate lawyers don't like paper. And so uh, they, they would discourage that. We did a lot of presentations after it was over saying, if, I, if we could do this again, what would we do differently? And, and the number one thing is that we would have communicated more quickly with our own employees. And um, I, I think the turning point was the day that the CEO said, just tell the lawyers and the bankers to back off because I'm the captain of this ship. <laughs> And we're going to start calling the signals here, and uh, and it was a it it was an incredible experience for a company, the leadership of a company, to go through a threat to the company, not just the way you've always had it, but the but something you believe in. Now, the interesting thing with the law is that it was the first time that a law was passed that said that a corporation had to pay attention to its communities where it did business and to its employees and not just to shareholders. So let's talk a minute about counseling. I've had other inter interviews with other Page Society members and they've expressed some concern over the current state of corporate public relations and the decline in the number of PR counselors to corporate CEOs. Um, it's been uh, noted that individuals who've been indicted in recent waves of corporate scandals, and there have been many of those, have not held PR positions. Um, so does that mean that those of you who held the counseling positions were the ethics police, guiding the upper management towards making correct ethical decisions? Um, is the trend changing now? Are we getting back into having counselors to uh, CEOs and, and having the PR person at the policy-making table? I, I don't feel quite as discouraged about corporate PR in the last decade as some may have been. Um, I think we have fewer companies today because there have been so many mergers, and so we don't see maybe as many um, people. And a, and a lot of senior people retired and 
functions may have shifted or changed a little bit or been integrated in a different way. Um, but I feel like there's still wonderful, solid corporate public relations practice going on today. And, and there are still um, hundreds of people sitting at the table helping CEOs make decisions. So I guess I'm not quite as gloom and doom about that as some may be. Uh, maybe it isn't all being done the way it used to be, but, but I don't think that's quite, that's all that bad. I do believe that the role has changed as, as, it, as you would expect it to, because we have more things available to us. I mean, you know, we, we talk about uh, how the kinds of technology we have available. You know, those of us that started on a manual typewriter and then, you know, thought we had died and gone to heaven when we had a self-correcting selectric, you know, <laughs> where you didn't have to, you know, or you didn't have to use carbon paper anymore or things like that. And going from mailing news releases to faxing news releases to the electronic transfer of something, you know, when you're, when you're disclosing information, I don't mean that everything is news releases, but, but for those th times when you have to make public announcements, to now just going, you know, on the wire directly, um, I mean, it's amazing, the speed of information, and I think that has changed a lot of what we do. Um, the, the being at the table, you know, we used to always say, oh, if we could just get to the table. I wasn't quite so sure it was all of that glory, <laughs> glorious at times to be at the table, but the fact is, what you want is, you want to be a place where the, you have the ear of the CEO, and where you can, because it's what you're doing are really the CEO's job. And so, I mean, in terms of public relationships, the reputation of the corporation. And so you become a partner. It isn't just you doing it. I mean, you're the CEO's partner. So I think that, that our counseling role um, has, is, is still there. It just may not be in the same form that it used to be. It's, uh, but I do, I do feel like like CEOs are still listening a lot. At least the CEOs I know are still paying a lot of attention to, to what their, their chief communications officer, chief public relations officer is telling them. Now, when there isn't, when you do have a problem, then I always say to people, pray for a crisis. You know, because whenever you have a crisis, then everybody says, where are those PR people? Let's bring them in here and let them show what they can do. And that is a time. I mean, it's just not all crises is, are bad. You know, you can, it's a great time to show what we can do and, um, and, and to really show how we have as much business sense as, as anyone else. If we have lost that key to the door, if we've lost that, then I think it's because we haven't paid enough attention to how business is changing or We've, we've, we've wanted to hold on to the, an old way of doing something when we needed to, to move more into a strategic counseling mindset uh, and not just into tactics or, uh, well, we can solve this by working with the media. You know, there isn't time. By the time the paper comes out or a television program goes on, you know, someone's been yelling on, the, on a blog or... Uh, somewhere they've been, they've already changed how people think about a company. So it is, um, it's an exciting time, but I just think it's a, it's a kind of a different time for PR people. It doesn't fit the old model. <laughs>